This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Shake Them Ropes post-WrestleMania edition. Probably going to be your podcast for the week, but uh, who knows? We'll see. You, we'll see, oh, we'll you see how we're feeling. Yeah, well, you never, like, okay, Raw could kick it off in a big way. They, Graves talked about it as the start of a new season, Hawkins. For the longest running episodic television show in American history. They like the brand new season bread on both sides. That's new a WWE. characters. Yeah. New pot, lo- new plot boat lines on top of a boat, a complete revamping. Oh yes. It's going to, it's no longer the sweet life of Zach and Cody. It's the sweet life of Zach and Cody at sea. <laughs> Chris Novembrito, Jeff Hawkins here with you this week, sponsored by my bookie and Manscaped. More about them later. But uh, this is the first weekend, I think. First WrestleMania since the beginning of Shake Them Ropes, where Big Brother was the was the storyline coming out now i'm not necessarily uh not big not brother yeah big brother big wwe brother. okay B- big brother wwe as opposed to nxt stealing the weekend uh, headlines i got gotcha. you that's gotcha. what i meant not oh. not george orwell yeah I, that's a, you said yes yeah, the big brother was that i was like i i ooh, this sounds ominous i'm wondering where no. we're going here okay santa big brother. clara may be an exception but i don't consider that a takeover per se that was just a house show to test how NXT would do. And that actually almost stole the weekend had it not been for the Seth Rollins cash in at the end of that mania. But uh, overall quick hits. I think WWE had a thumbs up weekend for both nights of WrestleMania. I like having two nights of WrestleMania. I think it helped the number of one-on-one matches they had really helped some guys who didn't never had a one-on-one match at WrestleMania getting some time here, like Apollo Crews. Uh, and, you know, the clunkers didn't overstay their welcome. So, I mean, and they paced it pretty well. They paced where they were going to put the slow parts towards the beginning and then loaded the back end with mostly good stuff. Uh, I, for one, I preferred night one to night two. Chris, just some general thoughts before we go into it. Yeah, so I I think you are right when you say that WWE kind of outperformed NXT in the two nights. I think a little bit different in terms of like where the quality was on NXT. I think it was a little bit more balanced. Um, there were some you know stinker matches on both nights, whereas I thought uh, maybe. I thought maybe night two with this. I, I thought, now I'm thinking about it. I think on balance, just WrestleMania was better. And I think it outperformed. I had low expectations coming into the show. Uh, I think the one thing that held me back from getting more into the matches, generally speaking, was the bad setup for a lot of these matches um, and the bad yes. storylines going into a lot of these matches. And so even when the matches kind of took off, it's good wrestling in just a vacuum that's not really what wrestling is wrestling is about stories that are enhanced and built and drawn out through good wrestling and so a lot of these matches were very good but they were good matches that punctuated the end of not very good narratives and so it made it hard for them to get to that next level that was a note. I, that was a mental note I made at the end of night one was that, look, I don't want necessarily a new Japan dominion show for WrestleMania. The problem here was all these video packages they did were awesome and told the story that they never told on television. And it drove me nuts like that. That Bianca Belair, Sasha Banks video package was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. It was everything I wanted this story to be. The cocksure veteran who had come up through the ranks doubting herself, but now she's the blueprint. Now she's had these glorious WrestleMania entrances. She is the boss going up against the kid who's just coming up, but is an athletic specimen 
of great strength and great agility who's coming to take her first title. And instead on TV, we got Reginald. <laughs> who was and then erased out of the story. <laughs> and I'm not saying like, oh, this is a grand injustice for Reggie Bechdel, but it was the story we were getting for all of these weeks. And like, you know, now you know it's, it, it's as though he never happened. And what does that mean? The road to WrestleMania wasn't really a road. WrestleMania is just the thing that you arrived at suddenly. Yeah, there, there's a there's a bit of a problem because we're just going to go right into the next cycle of fast lane. And manias don't become memorable anymore. That's the weird thing here is because you have all this television week to week and you're you're basically hitting the angle on the head week after week after week after week. Then the blow off doesn't seem to be as big of a deal anymore either. And that's a little bit of a like I I don't. I don't remember manias as well as I used to, but that just might be youth and how I grew up watching wrestling versus now where it's all just kind of a, a blur. But, you know, I, I can't getting back to the card. I can't make any any real complaints because all these video packages were awesome. And I'm just watching it going, how come I wasn't this invested in the angles when I was watching them? But now I am having watched these highlight packages. Once I started seeing the quality of the work match to match, I started just feeling more confident that each match was going to kind of keep delivering. I think maybe there's a little bit of a uh, momentum from night one that carried into night two. Night one was a good show despite the rain. And that I think maybe kind of set the tone for night two and night two carried, carried it on. It was largely a watchable show. Like, you know, there will be we got to go match by match here and my thoughts are a little disjointed right now it has been a long day for old Novi, um but i am happy to get into this card shall we kick into night one hawkins i have a couple of notes though from from notes. Uh, news notes first okay yes uh first of all you might have noticed that uh the commentary at least the play-by-play -play, was all done by one man that is michael cole I think people need to take a little bit easy on him. Michael Cole kind of having to do all the heavy lifting because Tom Phillips was taken off the show due to COVID-19 precautions. Now, this goes along with another story that formerly of ESPN, Adnan Verk is going to be starting as the play-by-play -play guy for Raw starting on Monday. Uh, Verk, I, I listened to his podcast. He has a football podcast with Michael Lombardi. That's very, very good, but... Verk kind of uh, left ESPN under a bit of a cloud for leaking news about ESPN to a news organization. I think he just kind of overstepped his bounds, but he was fired because of it. ESPN and them then got into some legalities and they both agreed not to sue each other. And that was it. We'll see how that goes. Don't know what the future holds for Tom Phillips, though. So that was very interesting that that news came at the same time as Phillips was yanked for COVID-19. It's very, how shall we say, Charlotte Flair in a way? Oh, 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 oh. I look at him sip his tea as he says that. Mm. I, I, I know see. nothing about that. I, I didn't ask about. I didn't ask anything about Tom Phillips this weekend. I, I was having some chats with some people during the mania, mostly, mostly just you know testing jokes on them before I put them on Twitter. But, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and the other news, 25,675 fans attended each night per WWE's PR, so grain of salt, making it 51,350 overall fans, enjoying the two nights of WrestleMania. And I'll tell you something, the performers and the crowd really helped, I think. I know, I know it's the safety stuff. I have all that, but, man, it really helped the performers a lot. So you got to take that also, you know, you got to take the good with the bad there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think another thing that is hard to calibrate, especially right after we have finished WrestleMania, is this is the first time in I don't know how long we have seen wrestling in front of an audience. And so those wrestlers are performing at a different level than they have been in the warehouse uh, in front of this TV screens. And I think it was probably energizing for them. And... No, of course I have the safety concerns about this, uh, but 
but you know, the net result is it was a better show. I'm not saying that's a worthwhile trade off. I'm just saying that like, you know, one of the things you get in that trade off is a better show. Very, very true. Uh, some differences in tone between night one and night two. I felt night one was more of a feel good type of thing where, you know, everybody's kind of happy with all the results there for the most part. Yeah, lots of baby faces winning, lots of smiles on faces, nice end to it with new champ being crowned. Night two got more into some of uh, some of the quote unquote storytelling, shall we say a little bit, uh, not so much crowd pleasing, but rather we're trying to tell this story and uh, you're going to have to go along with us kind of. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Like night one was a little more straight ahead um, and a little bit more like the feel good WrestleMania moments. Whereas night two is night two is about heels winning in a lot of ways. And it's where like, yeah, they, kinda, yeah, they backlog the heels. Um, I, I, and I guess you, I, it depends on how you want to define Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt. I have no, <laughs> I, I have I no like, idea what the hell is we, going on in that feud anymore. No, dude. as soon as you said that, I, and I, as soon as you said that, I go, well, that depends on how you define Randy Orton. Sure enough, I think it, Orton's the heel here. <laughs> I have no idea, thing. Hawkins. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I can't say I care, but I also don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, opening up night one, rain. We had a bit of a delay. Your boy Hawkins had jokes all night. Some of them popped. So welcome to any new listeners who may have been following me. My uh, my best one or what most well received was. Well, if the talent needs to escape on the boat, Vince has a separate boat ready for him to take him to safety. That one popped a few people in the company. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, a uh, a kind of a first inclement weather. Well, not a first, but a first that actually delayed the show. There was some inclement weather, I believe, at New York a few years ago. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they moved the broadcast team in a little bit on the tarp so that the audio equipment wouldn't get wet. Waited a half hour, got the all clear, the lightning one go. They have that old joke about Florida. If you don't like the weather, wait an hour. And uh, yeah, some some lightning and thunder threatening, but uh, Vince goes over God once again. It was an interesting little holding pattern that they were in for that 25, 30 minutes on night one. It it went on a bit long, but I thought it brought out some interesting promos along the way. Yes. Here. Yes, that that was the they did basically promo class live on there, and you can tell. And some passed, and some failed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Braun Strowman, fiery, more fiery in his promo than he was for any part of this program, which I liked. I liked him. I liked KO. Miz and Morrison, God bless them. They are the guys in your jazz band class who wrote out all their solos because they couldn't trust their improvisation. That thing was the most choreographed stilted promo. And I, I laughed at it, but still you're just like, man, I would have really liked to have seen them try and cut one from the heart there. I mean, uh, I, these guys have known each other for over a decade at this point. And like, they are actually friends and they certainly work together a whole bunch. Like you'd see them took improv classes at my theater. They should be, I, I, I know like this shouldn't be that hard. It'd be like, if you asked you and me to improvise a scene, we could get through it. They were just having the darndest time. And it's very strange to see two people who are actually friends, not be able to just like do it on camera for 30 seconds and like have the, the repartee thing going on. And you do that for a living all the time as a professional wrestler on a regular basis. And to your point, you attend improv classes and get all this training to be able to do it. And nah, so strange. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the better promos I thought, or at least it got the tension up a bit, was Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre getting in each other's faces right before we opened the show. And they indeed opened the show, which was a fascinating choice. And an even more fascinating choice, Bobby Lashley defeated Drew McIntyre with the Hurt Lock to retain the WWE Championship. I now, want to applaud you. Oh, um, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, go ahead, please. I want to be applauded. Uh, yeah, no, I wanted to applaud you for, for not correcting me on the last show for uh, thinking that this match was a triple threat for some reason and getting it confused with the uh, title match and the other one. I thought for some reason last year was in a triple threat match here. Um, like I got, I got that crossed up on the last show. Well, the weather was involved. So maybe, you know, they were added that the, the weather minute. affected me. It was, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it was, that was what, what did it. But as good as this match was, and I, it was two big dudes beating the crap out of each other. The large WWE ring does not do justice to that somersault dive that drew McIntyre does. I saw that thing live when he broke it out in Reseda in a smaller ring and that dude is a giant of a man it is impressive and the problem with having all these six nine six ten guys like uh damian priest and then before him the late luke harper doing dives is that it just seems natural to you until you can see it up close that thing was spectacular it is Match one was, of the things oh. that sneakily made WCW's usage of cruiserweights more effective. Um, having the slightly smaller ring brings them into a better scale and gives better kind of contrast. And to your point, also helps accentuate the size of people like Kevin Nash. When they go over to WCW, they seem a little bit bigger. Um, guys like Ray seem a little bit bigger, but like they, yeah, no, I, I think the small ring's actually better. I think WWE's ring is too big. Go ahead. Now, the problem, the problem with this was the angle behind it, because everything they did for this angle was not necessarily to get to this conclusion. We did not need Miz to cash in his money in the bank. We didn't need to break up the hurt business at all. That's the real problem with this conclusion, right? It has, it, it, it has no sort of um, narrative satisfaction to any of the setup. Like, yeah, okay, Lashley paid off miz to get a shot at the title and like goobered miz to get the title but the punchline is he didn't really need to do that anyways in the end because he's actually good enough to beat drew mcintyre who thought he was yeah. good enough to beat bobby lashley but I know, it turns out he wasn't you didn't need, you didn't need baron corbin to try and take him out either no <laughs> but but it's always good to get baron corbin on the go it's home always, show for 20 minutes you know, you know, 20 minutes and He's going to be the big baddie. And is he joining the Hurt Business now? Yes. These, Everyone's these favorite things. mini boss, Baron Corbin. That said, Baron Corbin Snickers commercial popped me. I don't. <laughs> no, I, I have nothing against the guy. It's just his character is horrible. Yes, his character yeah. is terrible. But yeah, it it, it just, it def if you're going to have Bobby Lashley win, just have him beat Drew for the title on the on the show. I thought for certain we're, because Drew didn't get his big cheer last year i thought okay we're gonna give it to him this year and then we're gonna start all over and then we can have lashley win next year or whatever i don't know what you now do with this championship because you have no title baby face title contenders for bobby lashley we gotta throw out ricochet for, <laughs> you know because he stood oh, up to drew in the locker room oh don't yeah 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 no. you did you forgot him you you tried to write him out you know who i'm talking about you know who i'm talking about you go ahead and spoil it it's slapjack no it's not gonna be slapjack. it's gonna be slapjack it's gonna be slapjack <laughs> It's going to be such It is new faction slapjack subculture debuting on raw all <laughs> night market market. That's why they trade. That's why they trademark subculture. So that's why they the, trademark the big slapjack title run. Yes. He's going to be a baby face champion with a faction. Neither show has a giant baby face in waiting where you look and you go. Yeah. Vince will take the title off of except maybe Randy Orton. Orton, if, if oh, wait, wait. Not a baby he might maybe be a heel maybe and he might maybe <laughs> also be a baby i don't know um he's whatever know you want him to be he, he's, he's like such a banks there yeah uh i would say big e is probably the that's on the other show uh yeah i mean the new days is kind of floating around also them losing the belts i think is a precursor to them reuniting oh kofi kofi versus lashley I, okay. I get, yeah, I guess you could do that. I'll take, I, no, I'll take I, that. Yeah, I'll take yeah. that. We can tease Kofi Mania again, and then everybody will get upset. That'll be you, you could even do a, a Woods uh, like run. He doesn't win, of course, but you could have Woods like challenge Lashley and just do something different with Woods. 
any other thoughts on Lashley and McIntyre? Um, I think that putting this to open the show did a disservice to the match. I get trying to start the show off hot. I get wanting to have the men's title match far enough away from the main event here that you weren't comping it and like you just were creating a bit of a mental division. But I would have maybe had this come on second or third. Um, I maybe third specifically. Um, something you know, a hot, meaningful match, third that could go a little bit longer. I think doing this right in the open made this just feel a little bit smaller than it needed to. And especially if you are trying to establish Lashley, I like, I guess I don't understand what the project of this match was at the end of it. I liked the match, but going to my like meta comment, I just don't know. Like if the narrative's not very good and the wrestling's good, how do I feel about the match then? Lashley's just going to turn baby face on Monday and it'll just all be like, huh? Okay. Yeah. Right. He'll turn on MVP, but that won't make any sense because MVP actually strategically <laughs> helped him in multiple times throughout this match. I don't need your help. <laughs> does, wait, you, I broke up the you definitely for most you. De No, but you definitely, most definitely did need his help. Yes, like the Claymores yes. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he like pulled him out of the ring and stuff. It's, it's a very weird story. Look, all the work rate people are going to get on this next one. But if you watched it and you can laugh at yourself a little, and hopefully the talent can, as things got progressively worse in this match, and I felt bad for them, but it was it was still fun to kind of watch this whole thing unfold. Natalia and Tamina win a tag team turmoil match by eliminating the Riot Squad. <laughs> Let's let's go through the things that tickled me. So, Billy Kay doing a Damian Mizdow gimmick with Carmella buys the in ring work, not so much. But she was not the <laughs> worst in ring worker in this match, Jeff. No, she was not. She no. was not. Billy Kay gets a win at WrestleMania by pinning. Lana, I believe, it was Lana or Naomi. She ended up pinning with the assistance of Carmella. Oh, I next don't know. Yeah. Next, come out the next are the Riot Squad. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you can't, you can't just gloss over Lana's yes, weird. Can. No, you can't. You cannot. If I have to go in depth in this match, I have to talk about the the kick thing. The, go ahead. The, the kicky poo. I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what do you want me to say? It, like, like she, you wanted uh, to go in depth to it. I did. It, it missed by a mile, Hawkins. It was horrible yes. looking. They had no way of covering it up. It was awful. Continue. Let's get through this thing. Are you telling me Lana is not a very good professional wrestler? I don't even think she's, a she's fine... really developing. Uh, and I don't she's a think... fine personality. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really see her growing. Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot then come out. Take out Billy Kay and Carmella, who try to do the same thing again. Definition of insanity. Uh, some rough going between Liv and Billy Kay here. Uh, but it was short. Didn't, well, actually, it wasn't short compared to that first one. It was about double the time. But, uh, yeah, I I have no other notes on this one. No, I have no notes on this. Okay. Then, <laughs> oh, the rain and new wardrobe. Two things that don't go well together. Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose come down. Mandy Rose eats it on the way down to the ring because she slips on there. Dana Brooke is having all sorts of issue with her wardrobe, as did Carmella all night. The Riot Squad come out, <laughs> get the pin, and then are told they are eliminated by Greg, <laughs> who, at least when he was wrong, he was loud wrong, and I'm all here for that. But yes, and, 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 and then the comedy of errors just gets worse with the wrong team being announced as the winners, and we get a correction. Uh, well, to backtrack on Mandy Rose, they had Mandy Rose put in these extensions for WrestleMania that were several inches longer than any length of hair she has ever had. And it, it was like, <laughs> it was too long. Like, I don't, I don't begrudge her for slipping on a very long ramp that had been rained on coming down in her ring boots. Like, that's fine. Like, you know, that, that happens. Um, 
I thought, and I don't begrudge her on the extensions either. It's just it's like a ridiculous looking. You could tell it was getting in her way. She was clearly you. You know, you mentioned wardrobe malfunctions. I mean, I saw her trying to like futz with the hair just as much as anything because it was like, you know, too long. Then the riot squad get eliminated by Natty and Tamina, meaning we get two heel teams in the event tomorrow. Enjoyed Tamina, number one, telling the ref to shut up. Again, underrated comedian Tamina Snuka. And also getting a pin win with the big splash. She's never gotten a win on any big card anywhere. I didn't mind that. Riot Squad, God bless them. They <laughs> Remember when they were building up the tag team division, they were the only real team, and you thought they're building them up for a run here, and then they just crushed them dead with the whole can they get along story. I feel bad for them. I feel bad for the Riot Squad, too, because they're a team where it's like, how are they going to get their momentum? You know, like, or they're like, not. It, they're not. Yeah, like, they're, they're just going to be stuck in mid-card hell forever. They'll get broken up, and Liv will be given a, given a bit of a push to see what she has now. That That's what's going to happen here. Oh, well, that, they'll be pushing the wrong one because Ruby is the worker of those two. Uh. Chris, I need you to uh, I need you to stamp where the skits were in this night one of WrestleMania if you can find it by chance, because I had forgotten to write down where the uh, where the various sketches were. Oh, and, like uh, like the Hogan sketches and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, like yeah, like the NWO thing. Uh, uh, you can oh do boy. that while I do a shout out to my first ad, our first sponsor, my bookie. Uh, it's April. April is upon us. Masters just happened. We're entering into playoff season with the NBA and the NHL. And also, hey, look, kids, baseball season has started. It doesn't matter whether or not you're playing multiple games, you're betting on the season, you're just betting on the overall winner or simply looking for player and game props. My bookie has you covered. Sign up today at mybookie.ag and use promo code ROPES, R-O-P-E-S, to secure a deposit bonus up to $1,000. Make sure you use our promo code so they know that we hooked you up. The promo code is ROPES, R-O-P-E-S, to claim your first deposit bonus. Again, NBA, NHL, no matter the sport, no matter the minute, MyBookie puts the action in your hands. And with in-game live betting, hey, they did have WrestleMania bets too, except for the triple threat. They took that off the board for some reason. But with a choice from thousands of lines and odds, you can turn any game day into payday. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with MyBookie. Use code ROPES. Get a deposit bonus up to one thousand dollars, and we thank them for their sponsorship. So, unless uh, unless you unless you can remember a sketch happening at this point, or we can just go over those at the end of the night. Yeah, uh, Cesaro, let's, oh. let's just do that because I am uh, struggling to find a uh, rundown that has sketches <laughs> in it that are written in like that. Cesaro defeating Seth Rollins in a singles match. A little bit of a shock. I liked this match. Would say I loved it per se, but I really did like it, and I'm happy to see Cesaro get a one-on-one -on -one win again. One of those guys who I don't believe ever had a singles match on a Mania since he got here. Uh, they work well together, as one would expect. Story is, of course, about the big spin. Seth Rollins working on Cesaro's arm to prevent that. We had one spin that was like nine rotations, and then the next one that was like about twenty. Uh, Twenty-three short. How many? 23. 23. Thank you. 23 spins. After that, that's pretty much all she wrote because the whole story was Seth didn't want to be spun. One, two, three. I have no other thoughts on this match. Uh, I. It's crazy to think that the build for one match is how dare you, you spin, spin me. <laughs> and, the, and a build for another match, a different match, is don't call me stupid. Um, how dare you call me stupid? Like, like to think that WrestleMania this year was built. I mean, uh, WrestleMania has been built around some silly angles in the past. It's just this one. Chris, was I'll have you know, Ernest Hemingway's "The Sun Also Rises" was originally going to be built on someone calling him stupid. That would be a poignant and powerful <laughs> reflection of the male in the 20th century and all of his <laughs> plights and perils and pitfalls. Um. So, what were we talking about? <laughs> Cesaro, we Cesaro, or, oh, yeah. or however Cesaro. Seth Rollins was pronouncing it. All right, yeah, no, I, I, weird... you know, I, went, I went to that other rundown. I lost which match I was on. All right, so now I'm back. I'm back. So, Cesaro, um, I thought that this match, 
you know, I'm looking now. I got 11 minutes and 27 seconds. I thought it was short. Um, it was a fine match for 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, I think I've seen Rollins and Cesaro have like an almost as good match on a Raw in a similar length of time. Uh, I think you know the story was coherent, albeit a simple story, maybe not a mania level story. Uh, I think that if you're going to elevate Cesaro, a guy who's been in the company, like what, since 2012 or something, he's been in the company a long time. Uh, if you're going to elevate a guy like Cesaro, then you need to have him involved in more solid storylines than this. Like he should have gotten this win over Seth Rollins at Rumble and should have been winning the Intercontinental. T- well, it, the, it's weird to say the Intercontinental title is like maybe a lateral move, potentially a step down from just beating Seth Rollins clean at Mania. But actually, you know what? I'll in take a better Cesaro world, and Bobby Lashley. I'll take Cesaro and Bobby Lashley as a program next. I am interested in. Cesaro. Oh wait, that's SmackDown. That's SmackDown. Never mind. Uh, well, Cesaro can always <laughs> hop brands. It's going to be Raw after Raw after Mania. Anything can happen. Have you ever heard of a little thing called the Wild Card <laughs> Rule? my friend the 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 quarterly transfer portal or whatever yeah 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 you it. can yeah, yeah it's like a little warped whistle in mario 3 you can uh use it a few <laughs> times in, in a year next up despite the jokes i'm gonna make about this still kind of a fun watch aj styles and the debuting almost defeating the new day of kofi kingston and xavier woods to win the tag team championship for raw in a match that had Ole Anderson rolling in his grave and he's not dead. The, <laughs> I did love Xavier yelling, we're cutting off the ring and working on one man. But the psychology of this match, there was a, there was a, I believe it was a SmackDown match or a Raw match. I can't remember what it was, but it was like <laughs> five baby faces against two heels once. Yes. It was just totally insane. <laughs> it's like wait a second and the heels sh- won the match right yes yeah well, no I, I believe they lost eventually but the whole thing was we're supposed to feel we're supposed to cheer for the baby faces here and feel you know, oh, it was just man. weird man uh look <laughs> almost sticking out his hand in the most awkward way to get a tag <laughs> AJ like, Styles. You, know, you can tell that he learned the rule of like hand up means make the tag, hand down means don't tag me, and like he's <laughs> doing it in the least subtle of ways ever. AJ Styles, you're Ricky Morton in peril. <laughs> As a heel. <laughs> As a heel. Uh finally, all leading up to the hot tag of Omos, who comes in quick some quick power moves i love the bane backbreaker spot that's always going to get a pop from me the ending was what it was with the exception or what it should be not what it was it it was the ending was what it should be almost i I like the phenomenal forum spot no it looks good yeah the only thing i didn't like was we're already teasing dissension as aj styles wants to come in and get the pin and almost just says no thank you boss one two three New Raw Tag Team Champions almost didn't show a whole lot, but what he showed was, you know, he's going to be that Vince McMahon big guy who does a couple of ooh and ah spots. And then eventually we're going to run this into the ground if we do it like Braun Strowman, I think. But uh can't believe they're teasing a dissension already between AJ and Omos. Yeah. So, look, uh... I have complicated thoughts on this otherwise very simple match, very predictable match. It's been an interesting build with Omos, who has been perhaps the most narratively consistent built character (laughs) in better part of two or three years at this company. They knew where the they most wanted to go. Narratively consistent character is the bodyguard guy. Okay, continue, please. I'm sorry. They knew where they wanted to go. They had an arc that they knew wanted to culminate in Mania, which they, they didn't know necessarily how they wanted to finish the, the, the story off, but the story is very simple. We're going to make this Omos guy look like, you know, Andre the Giant 2.0. Um, mm-hmm. we, we're going to create ooing and aahing. It's an old template, but it actually requires patience, which is the thing that WWE has historically not had in recent vintage. 
Um, they're not good at being patient. They're not good at building stories. Um, they, they, they get the bucksitis. They turn people left and right. Um, but in the case of Omos, they knew that they wanted to have him have this big spot in Mania, and they knew they were going to have him paired with AJ Styles. And once they you know, figure out the New Day piece, simple. I think they, in the go-home here, gave away too much of Omos's physicality. Because let's keep it real about this guy. He's limited. He has not had to actually meaningfully bump and did not meaningfully bump in this match. Yes, he delivered physicality, uh, but it was like, was it better than Kevin Nash? Mm, Yes. Well, maybe. Oh, no, no, no. I've seen Kevin Nash. Okay, in that one match against... No, I guess that one match against Nash? Mabel, Peak Nash was like doing Pescado. Oh, no, so it was crazy. no, we're not. T- I'm not talking Peak Nash. I mean Nash's debuts. Like it's better than Oz. Oh yeah, uh, better than Oz. Yes, yeah, better than Oz. Better than Oz. Yeah, I agree. Better than Oz. Um, <laughs> no, he's not supposed to take bumps his first time, and he's supposed to be no. A giant. But I'm. I, I know he's not supposed to. But I'm saying, I have doubts that this guy can go up and down, um, yeah. like like that, and. That matters in long form match storytelling. Otherwise, you're telling very limited matches or very limited stories. Now, if they protect him in a way that they did not protect Braun Strowman and did not protect Paul White when he was the big show, um, like that's a guy who really should never have lost. But if like Omos is presented as like a guy who just body slamming the dude is a feat, um, that'll be fine. But if you know he has to take regular bumps or whatever, I I, I have questions about that. Uh, but I thought. If they didn't on the go home show give away that cool spot where he did like the gorilla press slam and they did the camera angle that made him look like he was ten feet tall, like don't give away that spot. Uh, that should have been a spot that we got on Mania, um, even if it's just camera trickery for the home broadcast. Just having that at like Mania shot on the Mania cameras in the Mania venue, I think would have looked really cool. Um, I think that they shouldn't have given away the physicality. And, and then finally in the match, I thought that. His spots for what they were were well paced, not necessarily well executed, but he understands that a heel works slow. Um, mm-hmm. When he did and that a big back heel bre- works slow. Yeah, he he understood how that backbreaker psychology mm-hmm. works, and I was like, oh cool, this dude does get it on some level. So like, I've got I've got some hope for Omos. I, I you know, and then like I like the phenomenal forearm off of his shoulder. Um, and I also enjoyed when AJ was just like screaming, use the foot, cover him with the foot. Uh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> it, but, like, AJ just, Styles is so, so he great as funny. a heel. Yeah, he I can love be him. very funny as a heel. Yeah, uh, yeah, he, he's great as that cocksure. You know, he, he's a perfect aerial heel to me. You know, he's a little older, you know, a little Southern, <laughs> which makes for a good heel. Yeah, uh, also a good choice. Um, aesthetically to have Big E do the New Day's intro, I thought. I thought that gave the crowd a nice moment there. Got the energy ramped up for this match. I I, I really enjoyed that part of it too. Oh, I think it's good for the video packages and stuff long term too. It just makes sense. I believe here is where we had at least a sketch. I think we had the Hall of Fame part here, possibly. Uh but I will go into the sketch versus the Hall of Fame because I don't care. You have the NWO in the back talking with Titus and Hulk and out comes the true star of this WrestleMania weekend. Shake them ropes own beloved Aunt Pam Bailey looking, looking to get some guests for her talk show. X-Pac, the only guy I have any respect for after this thing, giving her the two sweet because he knows how hard she works. These other dudes not paying attention to the product. Don't understand my girl. Aunt Pam, wonderfully obnoxious in her getup. <laughs> Pure library chic, which, of course, I am. But now she has some gaudy jewelry. The glasses are getting bigger. <laughs> it's like a talk Perfect. show host from the 1980s. Yes, she's Sa- Sally Jesse Raphael. Sally Jesse Raphael. That, that, that yeah, is, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a very... A, oh, wait a second. Give, give the professor character for the arcane uh. reference, please. Well versed in the history history of wrestling. Thank you. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Uh, Giving some nice slow burns as she's getting dissed, especially to Hogan, which I appreciated. Uh, Look, 
interesting weekend for our girl. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about her on night two. I think someone did her a disservice by leaking that there was a possibility of Becky showing up for a ding dong. Hello segment and not getting it, but mostly, you know, the casuals didn't know about that or the Ronda Rousey stuff. She was originally penciled to be in to have a match with Becky. Becky wasn't ready yet. So they, they should have just made her the host as opposed to Titus and, and Hogan. But I guess we can't have a heel hosting a show. That's a bad look, but we should have had more running sketches. I think to make her even more obnoxious. If the payoff was going to be on night two, she gets decked hopefully for cheers. Yeah. Are you there? Uh, okay. I'm here. No, I'm here. I'm just trying, I'm trying to figure out where to hop on with Bailey's participation we can we can we, we can talk about it on on night two we can just talk yeah about I, it I, feel, I feel i feel like in night two it's more relevant in night one she's being used as a punchline night one was really about hogan and the cut the cut in on the cut in on the michael cole part was great when she was down there by the broadcast team i thought they were going to go with that for a second like she was going to challenge him to a match but that was the better of the two segments in my opinion on those on night one at least yeah but to get back to what I was saying about Hogan, um, I just, I find, I found his entire presence to be really useless over these two yes. years. Like he added absolutely nothing. And <laughs> I think what was even worse is his cheesy cosplay of the NWO character. Like it's one thing mm -hmm. when he's out there as Hulkamania, but him with the like cheesy fake spray painted belt, um, like, like the N and the W and the O are too clean. Like they, they don't actually look like they did on the old belt. And he just, I, I don't know, man. He's we'll talk I, about him on night two. Cause that cosplay was even worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, we had the cage match between Braun Strowman defeated and, and Shane McMahon, Braun Strowman defeating Shane McMahon in 11, 25 thought this over delivered. This was something I had very low hopes for, but you know, we had, Elias and Jackson Riker do the usual beat the guy up before the cage match to soften him up. Shane, I thought <laughs> Shane, once again, 51 year old man killing himself for his daddy's love. You know, did the van terminator spot was a nice violet Beauregard color purple about five minutes into this match, huffing and puffing. Did the very nice. I liked that heel wave spot where Braun just pops up, grabs his hand and rips off the, the, uh, the, the cage and then uh, and then Shane does a tumble from the top of a ramp hopefully for the very last year because I'm just he's gonna die on a Wrestlemania you mean he's the top of a cage a, top of a cage my fault top of a cage yeah. it's the top of a ramp right yeah yeah uh, yeah I uh, but you know it was perfectly inoffensive probably lasted a little too much too long than it should have but uh, you had some thoughts on Braun Strowman uh Braun Strowman in the go home. We talked about the go home show specifically and how Braun Strowman's <laughs> fighting on behalf of all of these stupid hyphen Americans. Stu stupid uh, hyphen Americans. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. No, Braun Strowman, like he made this clear. This was like his go home pitch too. Like this is the closing argument. It's like, <laughs> you need to get behind me, the fans, because I'm fighting for everyone who has ever been called stupid, which which really it encapsulates a large group of people. But I want to go one step further, Jeff. If you just kind of think about it, generally speaking, kind of a morally gray to trending morally black group of people. The stupid Americans are usually like not the best among us. Um, like, you know, I'm not saying it's cool to call people stupid, but uh, fighting on behalf of all the stupids is not necessarily the noble goal here in Live Hawkins. Well, the, how, how about the people who could have been smart and had potential, but they were emotionally broken by being called stupid by stupid. someone they love or someone in power, and then they just never applied themselves after that? Well, then, God, I hope that this match serves as a warm blanket that they can wrap their troubles up in, like a, like a little dream. And uh, and this match <laughs> will keep them warm at night. And the thing about Shane McMahon, 51-year-old year, Shane McMahon, hurling from the top of a cage and go, I'm not stupid anymore. He's stupid. Who's stupid is the 51-year-old man jumping from the top of the cage, not me. Was it really was it really a victory for stupid Americans if you don't plan for the interference before the match begins? 
I, so like there there are a number of issues here <laughs> like like one this is stu- it's a stupid narrative like no pun intended in this case but the payoff is sort of impossible because the the steel cage match is an utter non sequitur to being called stupid you're stupid oh yeah steel cage match like that doesn't make any sense so like what would be narrative satisfaction in that narrative satisfaction in that would be shane doing something stupid and getting himself trapped during the course of this match so getting his ankles stuck like in between the cage and like the turnbuckle or something like that go ahead but he did he he was waving goodbye and that was stupid and so braun got up and trapped his hand and kept him from falling to the ground. Yeah, I guess there you go. There's your stupid mic. I wanted him to. I wanted him to pick up the mic and do a Rocky Four speech to all the stupid Americans out there. I dedicate this match to you. But and maybe together, all of us stupid Americans. He he really only saw half of what like he didn't anticipate anything. The only thing that happened is in the end, Shane did something stupid, just like Braun, who had done stupid things along the way here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like respect the hell out of Shane McMahon for jumping off of the top of a steel cage. It was an impressive spot. For a but, flat back bump. Jeez. I know, man. Oh man. Like, no, dude, like that that was a rough bump, but this angle was flat too not like flat like that bump man like i elias stinks um and the elias and jackson jackson riker character stink jackson riker is a nebulously defined disciple of elias and we haven't had any explanation or fleshing out of like what their relationship even is now they're just like a premise at this point um and pairing them with shane mcmahon for no real reason made all of this just feel empty i thought the one thing that was going to maybe make this interesting would be the return of daba kato um which would have made some narrative satisfaction sense because shane mcmahon was building up daba kato and raw underground for for those of us who care about the history continuity what, what are you doing this stuff isn't real it's not serious stop stop being a mark <laughs> we had other plans for daba kato though We'll, we'll get yes, to that. Yes, we did. He he's he's now become a general in the Nigerian army. Yeah, and he's got the spike. Yeah, a promotion. He's got the the Umaga spike too. And what probably stole the weekend, unless you're gonna put it up against the main event from this night one, Bad Bunny and Damian Priest defeated John Morrison doing his best Becky Lynch hair cosplay and the Miz in a tag team match that over delivered by every metric on the board bad i marked for a la magistral cradle by bad bunny that's how low my expectations were for this and he came out to the point and dominated this match to the point that i thought damian priest was going to turn on him that's how much he dominated this match he did a canadian destroyer almost didn't get all of it on that one that made me a one a little bit nervous but Bad Bunny was awesome in this match, Chris. And you know what? The Morris, Morrison and the Miz, the Morrison, Morrison and the Miz made him look like a million bucks. Miz caught him on a dive. This match was perfectly inoffensive, and I had a blast. I agree with you on the Damian Priest point where y- you will forget who Bad Bunny was in the match with when this is over which is maybe a problem for the way this match was booked. There was not enough for Damian Priest to do in this dynamic here. But Bad Bunny, for his part, was fantastic. I I think, like, look, some things were a little clunky. The guy's Mm -hmm. uh, a beanpole in the ring. And so when you got this beanpole dude trying to do wrestling moves to guys who clearly look like they could just shrug him off if they wanted to, yeah, it requires a little bit of suspension and disbelief to go with it. But I thought Bad Bunny, for his part, was clearly trying, clearly is passionate about doing this. Um, you know, wanted to try to do stuff, wanted to have a good match. I think delivered a good match, you know, like the suplex into the Falcon Arrow. That was dope. Like, you know, and, and it looked perfectly timed with Damian Priest. So it actually made the moment and like the visual that they were trying to go for. I thought like the Lamani Straw Cradle 
um, it was the best I've ever seen in my life. No, but no. way better than I was expecting. What he but did him like, doing one. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, I got sense of myself. I was like, oh, okay. Like, all right, Bad Bunny's here to play. I see what's going on here. Um, so. Yeah, I thought that this was a good match. Um, I, I I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, he, you know, the other thing I enjoyed was the utterly bizarre Miz and Morrison entrance with all the bunnies <laughs> hopping out, and some of them are slipping and losing their head, and some of them are losing their ears on the way to the ring, and like the whole thing, like of like bunnies with one ears and stuff, just made for this like tremendously weird visual that I enjoyed, and Booker T was very funny during all of this where like like <laughs> he, he, this just amused him to no end uh, like he was like i like this stop 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 iron i'm enjoying this it's like whoa all right dude gotta get the nxt talent on the show i think the tall one i originally thought was gonna be baba tunde but i think that was actually kona reeves under there <laughs> the sticky tall yeah uh the the buddies <laughs> the guest commentators i could have done without all weekend uh but booker t for his for his was was fun jerry lawler i could have done without jb oh uh, yeah no let's talk about jerry real quickly here so there there is an episode of star trek the next generation hawkins you you didn't like star trek but i know you watched next gen um where scotty from the original series shows back up. It's like one of the first seasons of Star Trek Next Gen. And How like do you do fellow kids. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's, you know, there, he's there and he's a legend. And everyone's like, oh, it's Montgomery Scott. I can't believe I forget like what the setup is and like how Scotty's ahead like a hundred years or whatever, but he just is. Um, and they're like, oh wow, it's so great to see you there. And like he's trying to hang out on the Enterprise because like the Enterprise is this ship and he knows the Enterprise, but like he starts, you know, button a little bit with, uh, you know, Chief O'Brien and button a little bit with Worf and button a little bit with all the different, like, members of the crew. And, like, they don't quite get along. He's a little out of step. And, and over the course of the episode, it becomes very clear that Scott's time has passed and it's time for other people to, like, occupy those spots. And, like, Jerry on commentary, the second he slid into that, that King character... You know, when I first heard him, I was like, guy can still talk. He sounds clear. He's not, you know, like some other older talents that have like kind of maybe lost his step on the microphone. Like Jerry can still talk. It's just the jokes suck. Um, the King <laughs> character sucks. It, they, they're these anachronisms. Like they're not even dad jokes now. They're great grandpa jokes. I, uh, yeah, I'm not going to defend him. So no defend him hawkins this is a debate show. <laughs> the seventh Crossfire. grade joke book the seventh grade joke book he got from walden books only goes so far these days and no I'm just i heard he some of those in garfield's insults put downs and slams uh great collection might i add i'm happy he wasn't on the women's match let's just all be thankful for that and finally your main event a spectacular match a very good match. I'm not going to say legendary per se. I think a lot of people were putting a lot more on the historicalness of the historical thing and even including WWE a little much. I'm going to get to my minor quibbles with this in a second, but to get to the point, Bianca Belair didn't get the title in NXT, gets her first singles belt here, SmackDown Women's Championship, defeating Sasha Banks in a hell of a match at 17-15. Now, there are things that I disagree with the great majority about on this match. One of them was Bianca being overcome by emotion. And I'm going to tell you why I don't mind real emotion in matches. i like them after the match, especially if you're moved by getting the title. I want to see that. I want to see all that. I want to see real anger in matches, but old school. Jeff was a little put off by Sasha and 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 Sasha even fed this to a point, but Bianca not being able to get control of her emotions at first. And I'll tell you why, Chris. It, it's it's and this is this is a generational gap. It's not that I mind that people didn't mind this, but you are a professional wrestler. You are playing a character. This is not real. This this goes back into the don't be a mark for yourself kind of thing. Thinking, I'm not gonna go that hard on her for it but they bought into the historicalness too, just a little bit. And it 
made the match start off slow and you are a professional wrestler. You are playing a part. Once you are out on stage, you need to be centered. And she wasn't centered. And it worried me for the first three minutes of this match because she's, she's crying. Sasha's crying. We're kind of losing the story a little bit because you just know they want to hug and they can't. It, if if you're that happy for them, dangerous if they start doing physical moves that take yes. one another off their feet, and the emotions affect your ability and your normal control of those different moves. It, you know, it doesn't. If everyone's on their feet, it's one thing. But the second you pick someone up for a suplex, if there's even a little bit of like emotionality or you know whatever, it can lead to you dropping someone accidentally. We've seen stuff. We've seen. Failures and accidents happen with less. Yeah, I, and it, it's just one of those things. Like, yes, this is a big moment for you, but you you are playing a part here. Get in character and get to it. And that was my thing about this more than anything else. I don't mind that people loved this. Oh, I just love that they're so overwhelmed. I was like, but there's old school '80s Rasslin Hawkins professor character, please. Ah, oh, well versed in the history. Yes. yes, only Anderson never cried on his. <laughs> Harley Race never cried when he got the title, but yes, I, I get that. It, it after the first few bumps that they got in there, I loved your example of well, if you're doing a suplex and there could be, it's like Bianca Belair ain't letting go of nobody. <laughs> that thing, that that uh, that double uh, double slingshot suplex was great. Uh, I I thought there wasn't a real story to this match, and yes, as much as I loved the match. As much well, as how I can there be it. a story to the match if you don't really didn't have, have one. a yeah. story to the build? Um, yeah, this, it this started is, off a bit oh. as a squash, even to, to the point where I was like, is Sasha going to get any offense in? But please continue. Um, This is my thought on the selling of this match. So, like, I'm, you know, really excited. As you, you look back on the totality of this WrestleMania, um, the African-American representation on this card um was in no way could in no way be described as tokenistic i mean like throughout the card all throughout um a really really strong presence of african-american talents who were like really great um and so that is a big step forward for wwe i also think it's something that one can see with their eyes and so michael cole hitting you over the head with it right at the front felt um tacky uh is what i would say but i also think that part of that impulse was a way of them like retconning out reginald from the storyline and retconning in some sort of like more serious storyline to this build than had heretofore been there and i wish that they had actually built this mat if they wanted to do a historicity build i wish that they had actually done a historicity build like, if you're going to sell me, yeah, like, it would have been really cool. I think that would have been a very fun way to build this match. Um, but just kind of doing it the way they did, I, I don't know, just didn't leave me with, I think, uh, the desired effect. I thought the match was good. I'm with you. I thought it was for want of a story. So, in a lot of cases, what it was was extremely, especially for WWE, extremely high-level um, wrestling. Um, and in, in the context of the women's division, probably even higher than that. Um, but it was for want of purpose. Why is Bianca doing these things? Why does she need to whip Sasha? What What is the importance of that moment? Um, the symbolism and, and all of those things along the way that make, uh, you know, like when we talk about New Japan, like, you know, those sorts of matches like the okada classics or whatever there are symbolic moments in all of those matches that really elevated it into the four and a half four and three quarters five star status and for me this match didn't have any of those uh so it doesn't it doesn't quite get there for me but I like what well, i think the right person won bianca definitely should have won here um and i'm glad that she did uh and, and two with sasha i say streak Streak, 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 streak. streak. I want the streak, streak now. I want streak. the streak to be part of her story. Yeah. Because it's going to build year after year. For yeah. those of you who don't know, Sasha Banks is now 0 for 6, I believe. 
at WrestleMania? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's 0 for 7. 0 for, yeah. Might be 0 it, for 7. You're right. It might be 0 for 7. But, yeah, she is 0 for at WrestleMania. She should be 0 for until her last year and then get a big one. Yeah, they need to explain the hair thing because the hair thing is a total heel move. It's yeah. Bob Orton with the cast. Yep. It's it's uh it's Greg Valentine with the shin guard. It's you know Let's it, look at it's a bionic all... elbow or bionic yes. form. Yeah. Yes. Now if you had told the story that Sasha using the hair has angered her to the point and Sasha forgot it was a weapon, I could appreciate that. Props to Sasha for taking a hell of a whip. Did you see the welt on her after that? Oh like, no, right the, the working the working boots were on in this match, dude. Well, no, I just meant the welt that she got from the hair whip. No, I'm I'm after saying the they, match. They, they committed yeah. to the they committed to the physicality. Yeah, they yeah. committed to the physicality phenomenally. Yeah. It's just it's just they needed the story of what drove Bianca to eventually use this hair to then get the pin and get the KOD. Look. You can go back to me reviewing the May Young Classic first year and how high I was on Bianca Belair. I could not be happier for her. But we need some character development on the main roster other than I'm the EST, other than a catchphrase, because otherwise this is going to be a symbolic title reign and that's it. It's a bit of a problem with Sasha too. They just, she's the boss, she's the boss, she's the boss. And the problem with the boss character is that while they turned her baby face, and she was still the boss, which lends itself to being a better heel than a baby face. We, we need some deeper stories on this level to write. And that comes from the top guy. That doesn't come from the writers. It comes from the top guy allowing those things to happen. Because I know the writers want to do them. So, but yes, a possibly, dare I say, the best women's WrestleMania match I've seen. Uh, I, I, I have it ranked a little bit higher than Asuka and, and Charlotte that first year. Triple Threat's not terribly high on my list for for those three because of the Ric Flair involvement with the sexually assaulting Becky at ringside, which has since been edited out on the Peacock Network. Uh, I'm trying to think of other one, singles matches. I mean, you had like the four-way with <laughs> Bailey, Sasha, Charlotte, and Nia. You had Nia and Alexa. You know, Asuka is always solid, but I, I, I think uh, this is a this is a top WrestleMania women's match, and they should both be very proud of themselves. I love this match. Yeah, I thought it was certainly strong enough to close out the show. It's not like they left the show flat. Um, and that's yeah, oh, you know, the happy moment. People were cheering for it. Yeah, she was no, no, I mean, that, that's that's a tough task, and they cleared the bar. You know, like that's great. Yep, so that'll do it for night one. Let's give a shout out to our second sponsor, Manscaped. Time for the earmuffs if you have kids in the room. Support Laser for sniper. Shake Them Roses. <laughs> Support for Shake Them Roses brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. Manscaped is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide worldwide we have an exclusive offer for our listeners 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code ropes at manscape.com now we showed you product last episode we are on video at voices of wrestling channel at youtube got the nice thing here oh and oh the light look at the light go into the light Laser let's just see what you're sniper. doing you know we got the can't get the ball preserver out of the case and I put the other stuff away. But yeah, they've created the best ball hair trimmer ever, the Lawnmower 3.0. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming, grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. And boy, I do feel confident shaving my boys. And in addition, the trimmer comes with the aforementioned LED light for a more precise shave and is waterproof to make your shower shave clean and easy. Do not use the same trimmer you use on your face as your balls. That's Lord, just no. gross Don't do that. and Don't do nasty. That. No. Trim that junk of yours. Get rid of the jungle down there if you've been in quarantine this whole time. Use code ROPES at manscaped.com. Get 20% off for free shipping, and your balls will thank you. Again, 20% off and free shipping with the code ROPES at manscaped.com. That's 20% off, free shipping at Manscaped. Use code ROPES. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. And we thank them for sponsoring Shake Them Ropes and coming back home. Yeah, no, great product. Night two. 
of WrestleMania. <laughs> Chris, have you ever listened to a double album? Yeah, I, you know, I like double <laughs> album. Uh, to give you some background, <laughs> when Chris came up with that metaphor for NXT, he writes me and he just, and here's the text. It goes, have you ever listened to a double album? And I said, yes. And he writes me back and goes, I'm not done, you dink. I'm just like, there was no period there. at the end of this tweet, dear <laughs> listeners. Doesn't matter. It was just one line writing out the entire thought. It was, a, it was a rhetorical quick, question. A it was a rhetorical figure. question. Yes, it I do. Not. I do. Yes. I am quick on the on the tweets if you write me usually. And I'm awake. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you DM me at 3 a.m. on the Twitter and go, I'm bored, entertain me, like certain cat lady, then I can't get back to you that quick because I'm sleeping. But yes, <laughs> wow. we are told by someone in the company we are front loading the crap for night two to get to the good stuff later. I agree with this assessment. So we started oh, how, how dare you, sir? Uh, the crap in the box it, that was the, uh, that was wasn't, the theme. Yes, uh, Randy Orton <laughs> cementing his legacy defeated the fiend in five minutes and fifty seconds. Dude, this guy was trying to as ter in terms of being an all time lazy ass. Randy Orton is a genius. He managed to get himself a WrestleMania payday doing like this crap skitlet thing. Like, and he's been able to work through the entire year, like shooting these, like, you know, there was the quote unquote greatest wrestling match ever, which might've taken like six hours to tape in its entirety. It was like a series of stunts. There's this match. that's five minutes and 50 seconds. And he didn't really do anything other than RKO. RKO. Randy Orton has not had like a real wrestling match in probably the better part of 18 months. The match lasted five minutes and 50 seconds. The intros and <laughs> the intros and video packages where the fiend burned his crisp is reborn as the killer clown lasted about 23 minutes. And then you had the Hulk Hogan, Captain Crunch cosplay along with Titus with jokes that just died a tremendous death where they're talking in pirate trying to suck up to the audience. You have a giant jack in the box up at ringside. Abdullah the Butcher does not pop out. I was very disappointed by this. Arcane reference. Uh, well Alexa versed Bliss. In the history. Yeah. Yes. I, it's true. Al 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 Alexa Bliss makes two appearances. First as young, bubbly, sprightly 11 year old Alexa Bliss. And then later as a. I don't know how you say her last name, but bleeding from her face. Kara Davinia yeah. as the enchantress from Suicide Squad. All of a sudden, <laughs> where she goes all full, she goes full, full Papa Shango, full. <laughs> Let's put it this way: the Clampett saw a Derek coming out of Alexa Bliss and moved to Beverly Hills. That is black gold, Texas tea. This thing. <laughs> I love Bray Wyatt not selling and being that supernatural character, but this angle is wrong for WWE because they can't go to the dark places. They need to go with a, with a psychotic murder clown as a character. Nobody's going to die on this show. No one's going to be slaughtered and dismembered and never to be seen again on this thing. They don't even really Ever. allow good brainwashing or like any of the like the kind of like fun stuff, like the t really twisted stuff. They don't allow their characters to go to those places. The only good part of this match to me was the part where Randy Orton back dropped Bray Wyatt onto the table and Bray Wyatt got up, no sold it and put on the mandible claw. And, and every cool. other part of this match was stupid. And I hated it. And uh, I, for I one, appreciated, though, I appreciated Randy Orton trying to do the Mandy Rose tribute spot on the ramp. The ramp was too dry. He looked like he's at least having fun, knowing that he's kind of trolling all of us by walking so slow and taking his time. I, I just watched the uh, Stone Cold sessions with him, and he, he's having fun on this run, no matter what you say about it. But yes, this was... This lasted for five minutes. We all went, what the hell was that afterwards? And not just that, we had to get a full recap before Asuka and Rhea Ripley, which kind of killed them dead. 
<laughs> it was like, such a momentum killer because it was like, hey, remember this really bad part of the evening that you probably didn't enjoy? Well, we're going to recap every part of the story. Is another part of the story coming up? No, not at all. We won't revisit it for another night, but you're going to watch a recap of that bad part of the show right now before we get to Rhea Ripley and her match against Asuka. It was a bizarre move. It was a total one. It was like having... It, it's the opposite of having a match that dies like a death in between two good matches. This was like putting a skit or like a video package that ensured that the match after it died a death. I don't know what she Nia Jackson... It. No, go ahead. Nia Jackson, no. Shayna Baszler defended their tag team titles without Reginald for the for the women's tag team titles. So like, what's the point? Na- Against Natty and Tamina, playing an opening act here that decides, well, this is our big chance. Let's go a little long here, which they did, according to sources. Uh, <laughs> this match, crowd wanted Tamina to win. It was obviously setting up for hopefully Natty to get the win because of the knee spot. T- Tamina got a nice pop last night. I or last night, yeah, I enjoyed that quite a bit. But this match wasn't very good. Um, Shayna Baszler with the ridiculous raccoon makeup, at least now that makes her eyes wide open when, when she's in shock. And now she has to do that more often, a little more often than you'd like from an ass kicker like Shayna. I thought they worked hard, but nobody was really into this. And it's a bit of a shame. They overstayed their welcome a little bit just to get that ridiculous. You think you're pitting the right person, but of course we're not really professional athletes full of focus. Shayna gets a Carafuna clutch on Natty, puts her to sleep, end of the match. Any thoughts? Yeah, it, this match was very just there for me. Uh, Tamina was a little better received than I was expecting. Um, people like the reboot of Tamina. I like, I, you know, we've talked about her. I don't think she, I think she's funny. I don't think she's like untalented. She's never been that good mm-hmm. in the ring. Um, Naya, man. Um, I Like, she has been in the company a long time and she is like, she cannot deliver in the monster heel role in which she is cast. And like, it's really clear when she has to have the monster heel versus monster heel square off. And like Tamina utterly, and not just by like the booking of baby face versus heel, but like, Tamina just clearly outclasses her in every single way, in the mannerisms, in the actual carriage of a monster heel. Like, Naya does not get it. Um, she, look, I just, I'm not really convinced she's got really, um, she, I don't think she's at a WWE level, I'll be honest. The time to start cussing out your opponent and cutting promos and slapping them around is not 12 minutes into the match. And that that was the most fascinating thing from Nia Jax was her potty mouth and her deciding to cut a mid-match promo. But yeah, I would agree. Uh, moving on to better things. Kevin Owens defeating Sami Zayn, Logan Paul at ringside in a singles match that went nine minutes and 20 seconds, but felt much shorter than that for some reason to me. Logan Paul, I enjoyed his selling of all the big moves. I know that the camera cuts were a little annoying, but every time they cut to Logan Paul, he is cringing at super kicks and power bombs. I thought he sold the, the end. I mean, we all knew the stunner was coming, and I thought he sold it like a champ, even towards the end when they cut the close-up to him and he goes, what happened kind of thing. Owens and Sami Zayn are, of course... Lovely, lovely together. They're destined to do this against each other forever. Bit too story heavy rather than big moves, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Kevin Owens not getting to go off the pirate ship. I sarcastically asked my guy in WWE, is he going to do that? He goes, are you kidding? Would take a jetpack to get up there. And I was just like, that's sarcasm. I didn't really mean it, but uh, any thoughts on Owens and Zayn? This was like not like an all time great Owens and Zayn match uh, on a level. I thought, you know, the Logan Paul interaction was what we thought it was going to be. Uh, it was fine. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, it was fine. I thought Logan Paul was. It was fine. good. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't great, but it was good. Yeah, you know, this and... is not. This is not like Bad Bunny or anything like that. This, this is no. fine. This is this, like, look, uh, Zayn and Owens have killed themselves for our amusement for years. If they want to have an easier night out on a big payday, I can live with that. Professional sketch comedian Riddle backstage with the great Kali. You know, some people obviously... are just funny. Some people are just funny. Kali obviously missed a cue of some kind, and Riddle, Riddle finally getting karma for leaving Asuka hanging, is left hanging by Kali until Rob Van Dam comes in for a plug of his rolling papers, which is going to be edited out. There is no. <laughs> get it, Rob. Get it, Rob. Get it, Rob. My and Matt takes him. Matt puts him in his pocket. Save get it up it. for later. Hell yeah. And so he goes down to a scoot on the ramp on a scooter. <laughs> Seagulls, some of which are or doves, dressed as pirates, come out of his feet. <laughs> And then, and then and then Seamus gets to beat the crap out of him for 1050. Seamus beating Riddle for the US championship. Old here. man it, bangers is your US champion again. Including again. an accidental kick to the mouth on the brogue kick that hits <laughs> hit Riddle in the mouth when he was doing a moonsault. I think Riddle needs to be given a little bit more tough guy credibility for the MMA as opposed to just moves type of thing. I loved the beating. I wanted beatings from both people. I wanted Seamus to get beat on a little bit more by, by Riddle here. Uh, you know, look, Seamus, Seamus beat the crap out of this dude. I mean, I, those, I know, those, I those, uh, was uh, it bells of the Bowery thing? That yeah. thing that, that was not pleasant to watch at times. Uh, banger of a match though. Good. You know, and Seamus, that's, that's why we call Seamus, old man bangers. Seamus is going to come out, say fella a little bit, and I like to fight, and we'll have a... You know what would be cool? I got a fresh angle for you. What if Seamus, hear me out, had a feud against another legend, a guy from yesteryear, but the kid's still kind of like, and you're like, this kind of covers the whole audience, Jeff Hardy. And you know what could uh, you know what could culminate in a bar fight because they oh, talk I mean, about the drinking. Like here's the thing: you pull in a little bit of the realism, and Jeff Hardy will probably have another relapse at that point. It'd be great. Um, so yeah, like I think, um, no, I I think if this results in Matt Riddle getting his head out of the clouds in as a character, I'm fine with that. I worry that this is just going to be a continuation of a down cycle to him being scooter riddle. Um, Cause they really like this whole like Matt riddle crap businessman who shows up and proposes to you a horrible piece of business. Like, Hey bro, you know, it'd be really cool. Is like, if you got a truck and you opened up a shop that in your truck that sold other trucks that you could run shops out of so that like people could see your truck shop and then buy their own truck shop at your truck shop. What if you, what if you had a toilet store in the restaurant and then they could just go after they eat? That'd be cool. <laughs> okay. A hot dog that is filled with a tiny pizza. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, uh, I have no other thoughts on Riddle. I <laughs> Just... he he stay. No, they can rebuild him as as a legit ass kicker. He does have real credibility, but like mm. this gimmicky spot oriented style is the absolute opposite of what I want out of a Matthew Riddle match. What I want out of Matthew Riddle is like a kind of kinetic almost MMA style match and a guy like Seamus should be the perfect dude to get some of that stiffness out of him and like actually get some of that snug work out of him. Um, and right now, that, that's what I was yeah. going to say. Five seconds into this match, Seamus grabs a headlock and I died. I freaking died. We're going to go old school heat right out of the bat. Cause people might like riddle. 
Grab the headlock, brother. <laughs> Harley Race would be proud, man. Uh, yeah, Riddle resigned, and uh, McMahon finds him funny. So, you know, we'll see. Another guy getting a singles match for the first time on a mania, Apollo Crews defeating Big E for the WWE Intercontinental Championship. Big E gets the big Wale entrance only to lose. We find out a Nigerian drum fight is a no holds barred fight with drums it just hurts around like the hell. Ring. Yeah, it just it just hurts like hell. Is what a Nigerian and, and it involves Apollo Crews killing himself for <laughs> for the Good Intercontinental Lord. title. My man took some bumps in this match from the Big E dive the to Uranagi. the Uranagi on the stairs was just, he landed on that arm and I hope he didn't break it because it looked like he landed on his arm and then landed on his ribs on the corner. Neither of those could have been pleasant. We get the re-emergence, the re-debut in his own almost role. So we now have two of these bodyguards on SmackDown of Baba Tunde, AKA Dabo Kato. He has joined the Nigerian military and has been promoted to general. This is general Aziz. Oh, is that his <laughs> um, name? Apollo was referring to a one general Aziz in his promo. So I believe he will be general Aziz captain of Apollo's militia. Yes. I believe that will be the name. Okay. Well, that's not great. Um, but I thought this match prior to the reemergence of, uh, <coughs> Dabakato was a pretty good match. Like it yes. was, if they didn't do this gimmick finish and, and Apollo Cruz just went over, which is what I assumed was going to happen, especially, at, you know, like it just made sense. Um, if he just went over clean. This would have been maybe my sneaky match of the weekend. Not like my overall number one match of, of WrestleMania week. But like this match was so physical in the time it got. Like they beat the crap out of each other. Those kendo stick shots. Like the first one that Big E laid into Apollo Crews was like, oh, oh, okay. We're working like that. Yeah. The, the beginning of that match had me you know, doing the Joe Lanza pacing thing. Cause they go, Hey, we're going to, they both roll out, get kendo sticks. And then they start whacking the crap out of each other. I go, this is, this might be my, <laughs> my Vader, bam, bam, Bigelow yeah. match. I've been dreaming of, you know, and, just and it, hose it, was, me, baby. it was for that. The five of the six minutes of it, which is crazy. It was only six minutes. Um, I mean, we didn't even really get a good usage of the gong which to me is a, a bit of a crime. Like <laughs> one gong spot. Like, come on now. We need more than that. You know, it hits the gong. Hey, we want some new day gong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, at least throw them into the gong or something, you know, yes. like, uh, like yes. ma make it, make it. And then the like... unknown comic comes out after the gong and does five minutes. And <laughs> yeah. But no, I just like, uh... I, I mean, other, other than the reemergence of Dabakato, which uh, again, like I, I understand how some people see an affirmative case for this Apollo Crews character, but I just think that given WWE's history, their general instincts with these type of characters, and now, like, paramilitary Dabakato as General Aziz, I think that gives you more than enough reason for some skepticism to start to be mounting. And then I believe we had not only, not only the, uh, well, actually I'm getting it mixed up with the hall of fame when that was, but, uh, no, we had the final, <laughs> final suck up to the fans type of thing before we got into the recap of Orton and the fiend with the Titus and Hogan come out and go, you know, the real winners this weekend were you, the WWE universe, the real heroes. You know, so they can all chant. We are awesome. And of course the reemergence of one aunt Pam to come out and say, this is all crap that she should have been hosting this all along, which is true in so many ways. She calls the fans idiot. She calls Michael Cole an idiot, which makes the fans <laughs> cheer her, cheer her. The Bellas come out and they were expecting people to boo Bailey 
and cheer the Bellas because of a John Cena diss. It it was over once she called them Elmo though. Like yes, I don't, when she I called don't them know. twin when elbows, I Elmo, died. Yeah, I, I dude, I, that that's one of those gimmick killers where it's like, oh man, I don't know. Like, yeah, El- that's Elmo. an insult you can't come back from. That's one. Yeah, that, that. yeah, yeah. That's a tough Aunt one. Bam gets smacked in the face hard, takes a hell of a bump on this ramp. Good lord! And they were ex- and they were expecting the audience to boo the woman who carried this company through a pandemic over three shows. And what I was told, they were thinking, well, maybe they heard of the be- they were expecting Becky or Ronda, and they booed. But I don't think the casuals would have heard this news. Per se, I just think they want they want to cheer Bailey, or they at least appreciate what she's done. So she's not going to get booed, and they wanted her on this card, I think. And I think they, they were mad about her not being on the card. So they weren't going to boo you taking down Bailey. Plus, Bailey is not a character, a heel, who really runs down the audience, except to call them sheep. She's not insulting them. She's not, you know, she's not the heel you want to see get beat up. So I, I just think there was a miscalculation on, 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 the, uh, on the part of Vince. Yeah, I, I think that though in Nikki Bella's latter run, she made it a point to really demonstrate that she did have a good command of wrestling. In the end, I think the Bellas are mostly remembered as kind of, um, I don't want to say like, uh, and not quite divas. As, they're remembered yeah, as divas. Remember, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. They're remembered as divas, whereas Bailey and Sasha are remembered quite clearly as the women who, Bailey in particular, um, who was not glamorous in the same way the Bellas are, and could work in a way that the Bellas never could, and how. Bailey was sort of like ignore like the Bella's whole ladder run was sort of at the expense of the four horsewomen uh the original NXT four horsewomen there was a lot of Nikki Bella when there could have been a lot of Sasha Banks and a lot of Bailey and a real push hashtag give divas a chance yeah 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 like so I I mean I I think that there's a lot of that that lasts there it's not that people necessarily hate the Bellas and they they resent them they resent what they they resented the proxy representation of what they were like the, what the, what the Bellas represented the thinking the Bellas represented. That's not the Bellas fault, but that's like the fault. You know, Vince has a way of thinking and you see that way of thinking manifest in Nikki and Brie Bella. So after killing this crowd in a bit with the video packages and the skits, then we're going to send out Rhea Ripley who defeats Asuka for her first big title on the main roster beating Asuka in 13 minutes and 30 seconds. This match kind of died a death. It got picked up in some places, which was nice. This match to me would have gone much better if Rhea Ripley had been someone who you were rooting for because of the redemption of last year losing to Charlotte. You could have healed Asuka very easily, even though she has the respect of the crowd. No one's going to boo Asuka, but they could cheer Rhea. And the problem here was people wanted to boo Rhea Ripley. And... Well, she was presented this, sort of as the heel going into this. Yeah, she was. Well, she turned yeah. on Asuka. Yeah, so, yes. right. And yeah, yeah. So, like, why wouldn't they be booing her? Yeah, and this match was kind of plotty, I think. I Not plotty, this, but plotting. This, no, I, I, I didn't think that this clicked. I, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, I, you know, I'm not Asuka did her best here. She took some massive bumps. I thought, I thought there were moments of this match that were really good. But it never, but it never they... went into a series of moments that were really good. They were just mm-hmm. like, there's a moment, and then like stuff kind of got. It wasn't even like they're blowing spots. Is that there's just no sense of rhythm? Like you know, a criticism I guess we had a little bit of Bianca and Sasha, where it's like there was no substance to the moves. It, it felt like that too between Rhea and Oscar. Like you know. What was Asuka's strategy in this match? Yeah. The the thing was, in the Bianca-Sasha match, Bianca beat the crap out of Sasha. And then Sasha, that story, the story in the ring was 
the savvy veteran started to take certain shortcuts and work on certain parts and use the hair to tie her up so she couldn't do this stuff. The problem here was Asuka never, it wasn't the story of David and Goliath, so to speak. It wasn't Asuka trying to use her power because we all know she's an ass kicker and we love watching her be an ass kicker. But, you know, she'd do a couple kicks and do a hip check and she does the hip check way too much in her matches now versus, you know, being back fist spinning, which we got a little bit of. We never got to see Rhea really kill Asuka until the end. And I think they need she needed to kill Asuka from the get go. Watch we Asuka also didn't come get back. We also see Asuka try to kill Rhea either. And I think yeah. seeing Rhea overcome that, like, if you want to get Rhea over as a monster, it's super important that, like, she eats a ton of Asuka's offense mm -hmm. and then, like, blows past it, like, looks at Asuka as, like, cool, all right, little girl, that's over now, and I'm about to crush you. Like, I am yeah. ready for Asuka. And, like, we didn't really get, like, at the end of the match, Asuka's selling it like, oh, my God, she was ready for Asuka, and, like, she did a really nice job with that non-verbally. But we should have had that moment at some point during the match. Asuka should yeah. have realized that, like, Rhea's ready for Asuka. And so then that should have forced Asuka into a second gear. And then Rhea overcomes that, and then Rhea wins the match. Uh, when Sasha the had that moment in her match. Yeah, Sasha had that moment in her match. Asuka should have had that moment in her match as well. And, and when Rhea hit the Riptide, it just felt, I wouldn't say it was, like, out of nowhere, but it felt rushed because it's like, oh, okay, that's it. You guys, like, aren't going to take it to the next level. Um, and yeah, it was it, it was good, but meh. I yeah, thought. It, it was been, it, this could have been a raw match. It really could have been. Yeah, yeah, could have yeah. been a raw main oh, event. That that's that's actually a good good criticism there. It, it was it could have been a raw match. Doesn't feel like it was big enough for Mania. Like we like both competitors, it just didn't really kick it into that second gear. I think you're dead on in your analysis. And then finally, a triple threat match, where as you know, there's no DQ in a triple threat. Little Nate lets things just go all over the damn place. Good Charles Robinson. Mm. Roman Reigns with Jey Uso and Paul Heyman defeated both Edge and Daniel Bryan. People wanted to cheer Edge. We knew they wanted to cheer Edge. Even when they tried to heal Edge, they wanted to cheer Edge because he's doing spots where he kills people like the concerto. Did they ever decide what the story was of this match? Because I was watching the recap package, and it's like they never decided who was more morally clear between edge and Daniel Bryan. They both came off as slightly psychotic in the final build. Yes, they did. And that's, that was a problem in this match even. Yeah. Because he eventually, because edge eventually loses it about halfway through this match. It just decides he's going to start <laughs> killing people with parts of chairs in their mouth. And he has, a, you know, he gets the bug eyes and he's, you know, he's, middle-aged crazy kind of but it was never really you know clear really. who had the moral yeah. high ground and because it's like on one hand this... edge is kind of right like he's coming back and like he won the rumble and daniel bryan's initial insertion into this storyline is completely just like daniel bryan going like well i think the people deserve me in wrestlemania um like it really is sort of like out of nowhere um and then what i thought was particularly funny it, it it tell it's like a minor oversight in the video package, but it's funny to me. Is that Daniel Bryan says, not you know I should be champion right now after getting Roman Reigns to tap out in that match. He goes, I should be going to WrestleMania and being in that main event. Like it's not actually framed in the the injustice that I'm actually supposed to be <laughs> champion right now. <laughs> he tapped out to me, you idiot. Uh, like uh, it's no, I should be going to WrestleMania right now like yeah it's <laughs> jay uso gets a main event payday we're going out there super kicking edge super kicking daniel bryan charles robinson what do you want me to do about it it's like dude you just throw him out fool <laughs> yeah that's the problem with the drama in a roman reigns thing is you're you're waiting for all the you're waiting for all the interference to stop and then you can finally get to the story oh if he had thrown out jay i would have thought jimmy was going to show up like, like I, they, I'm just so used to like Roman Reigns stuff having like additional, you know, Michigas. There's just like a whole bunch of stuff that surrounds that crap. The actual physicality was something. 
Yeah. The double spear spot where it looked like one of them dislocated their shoulder. Thought was pretty great. Uh, look, these guys are all really good. It's just, it was just one of those things where it was like, once we got to the three way, it's your usual two guys fight while another guy rests outside. Then he comes in, throws the other guy out, two guys in. Problem with this is now Roman is now cleaned out SmackDown pretty much because he pins both guys after doing concertos. Again, let's get a little uncomfortable about doing a concerto on the guy with the concussion story and a guy with the neck problem. I don't know. It's just me. Just old they, man I Hawkins. Mean, they, have, they have changed the angles on how they do the concerto, but I, I just, yes. like, it, it makes me uncomfortable watching that spot. Uh, it just, yeah. and yeah, I, I don't know. Like, but now who do you have for Roman to fight? Anywhere, because Edge and Daniel is Bryan Big are probably e going to go. SmackDown, or is Cesaro Yes, he is. You can okay. have Big E get elevated after losing yeah. a Nigerian drum fight. It feels like Brock Lesnar is being brought for one of these guys, or, or both of these guys, because you'd bring Brock back for either guy here. There's stories to be told, because yeah. Lashley and Lesnar have been talking smack, and Reigns is now with Heyman, so you could bring him back against them. It would it's be fun to see Brock show up as a baby face up against Heyman and Reigns and all of that. And like, how will Heyman screw over Brock? Um, like, that's intriguing. I would like to watch Brock as a baby face. Um, you could redo KO and, Ro and Roman again. <laughs> you can. I, I think that KO and Roman is is sort of like jeff hardy and sheamus there is no such <laughs> thing as too much of a good thing uh it more the merrier and the better like a fine wine that you keep drinking you drink a gallon of every time you just, you just, it's called franzia and you can get it at the store it's cheap <laughs> it's, it's giamatti drinking that entire <laughs> spit thing and <laughs> in sideways it's just it's all, it's yeah go out there and kill yourself for our amusement again jeff you're 25 again right no I, I, here's the thing he just needs to have one more ladder match on smackdown where he jumps in between the stairs and a barricade uh I think against really edge true. let's yeah, make it yeah. against edge for old time's sake but overall again a hell of a weekend for the wwe we snark because we care the storytelling had a little bit to be but desired for the what matches do you think about themselves Roman winning I, I guess i didn't really get into that um i don't like roman winning here i think it was too cute by half i think roman needed to lose i think i think roman know, had to win in this match <laughs> i do why yeah I, I i because he's the baddest guy on on there and it's you can't the problem was turning edge heel if Edge had been a baby face, I'd be all for Edge winning this because it'd be 10 years. To, he, he had the story 10 years to the day he had to give up the title or was it 10 years to the day he won at WrestleMania, the title, something like that. And I give it back to him. Edge, I mean, I know they haven't done a good job telling the story with him, but Edge is the guy who should be winning the title here. Yes. Right, rightly or wrongly. He should, but you can't do that with heel. You can't do that with heel Edge. I don't know about that. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Because Roman's the main heel. So if you had Edge come back for the one last run, that would say that's, Usa. That's, that's why he's the ultimate opportunist. He's screwing over other heels even. <laughs> the problem here was they healed him against Daniel Bryan. <laughs> I don't, yeah. that's, that was that was the mistake here. I mean, I... I mean, the problem you know, was inserting Daniel Bryan. I love Daniel Bryan, so this is no yes. knock on him. The problem was inserting Daniel Bryan into the story in the first place. And then not taking the pin. Yeah, like... From one of the other two. He took the pin, but both guys took the pin, and now right. they're both useless in this right. program. Right, that's the other thing is, like, I, I think that they... Both these dudes got knocked down the card in a serious way because of the I stack both of you pin. Even with all yeah. the... I, I didn't like that. I get how, like, Edge is like, I'm giving back to the younger generations, man. And Daniel Bryan's like, I'm selfless. But, like, I just think in terms of... I get all that as a human being. You do have to protect your character. And I, I think that, like, that was unnecessary. Have Roman do that to one of the two guys. And, like, have... 
have them lay across both of them because they're square out, but like stacking them on top of each other, I just thought was gratuitous. Bad visuals. And as is WrestleMania tradition, we're booing Roman Reigns at the end of the night. Yeah, but at least it makes sense for once. Yeah. yeah. And at least it's the desired outcome. I mean, I like strong heels, but this was too strong, especially with the Uso interference in there. But and overall, it was also I enjoyed not strong, the match. It was also not strong enough because of the Uso interference. I like, agree. I agree. Yeah, like, like, like it, it's uh, what's the other match that held all the interference in it? Um, I, I, but like they 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 relied on that a little tonight, too or maybe it was the first night. It was the first night, and it was uh, it was Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman beating yeah. Shane. Yeah, Braun Strowman beating. There was a lot of outside interference in there. Um, yeah, so. So that ended for us. You can follow me. Or once again, let's let's thank our sponsors, my bookie and Manscaped. Get your deposit matched up to a thousand dollars using code ropes at mybookie.ag. Get twenty percent off plus free shipping with the code ropes at manscaped.com. You can follow me at crap game thirteen. You can follow Chris at DWATG. You can just follow the show and get all our episode drops at Shake Them Ropes, all one word. We are part of the Voices of Wrestling Network. Voices of Wrestling on YouTube video uh, of this show. If you want to see our faces and how we look at each other in the camera occasionally when I get look at the camera uh, over there. Uh, yeah. And uh, you can tweet to us about wrestling at any time. Chris also does shows about politics calls. Don't worry about the government. Thus the name DWATG. Chris, tell the people about them. Yeah, so don't worry about the government. You can find over at Don't Worry uh, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spotify. You can support the show at patreon.com slash DWATG. I've been a little delinquent because I've been working a bunch here, and I'm going to take some time off this week and tape another episode of, of that fine product uh, of Don't Worry About the Government. Also, apparently, Hawkins, I'm going to be assisting in making the Voices of Wrestling Tourism Suggestion Guide for next year's <laughs> WrestleMania here in Rick Dallas. hit you up, did he? Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been hit up uh, to assist in this. Um, and I know all the hot spots. And actually, odds are, if you come out and see WrestleMania here in Dallas, my band will probably be playing somewhere around town at that point. Um, like I mean, realistically, uh, I I'll try to get I might even try to get us booked at some of these shows. Uh, like you know why not? Um, so come on out, come and see our band, come experience the magic that is Dallas next year. Uh, but check out. Don't worry about the government in the interim which you can find at don'tworry.tv, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. Hoggins, I'm tired. It's late. This is, it was fun, but there was so much wrestling. That's why we're going to take probably an extended week off here and uh, see you back next week. Bye-bye.